For years I've been working on getting outdoor sculpture into Sarasota. We started it well, in about 1952 and in 55 I did a big St. Francis in ferro cement and one of the reasons that I got so many pieces out is because I was able to match budgets. Architects had big buildings and very low budgets for art. So I developed a ferro cement technique which allowed you to do a big piece with a minimum of material expense. Then I came upon the uh, copper technique doing uh, Nobody's Listening in 1962 for the City Hall of Sarasota and uh, was able to come into the minuscule budget that City Fathers had put forth. So that I want to teach this at New College and it's very difficult for a student who hasn't had as many years in sculpture as I have to pick up on wrapping and welding sheet copper around plain air. So uh, this technique is hopefully uh, a way of enabling students to do large monumental sculpture uh, without having to spend as much time as I did inventing the technique. So this is what we'll show in this tape. We'll be doing ferro-cement sculpture, sheathing it with the copper, only stopping at the mold line at the separation. We'll weld up to the mold line, then we'll tech screw the edges, and then take it apart, uh, much like you'd splice a lobster down the middle and take the shell off, take the meat out, and put the shell back together. This is one of the sculptures that is going to the City Hall of Sarasota. It was donated. It was commissioned originally by uh, Southgate Shopping Center. And they were remodeling, so they gave them to the city. So these will be installed shortly around the City Hall to go with the nobody's listening that's been there for some years. They're all done uh, one, of a, one of a kind. Uh, they're not done over a matrix. There's a guardian and sentinel and, and the pioneer family. There's the archangel back. Large piece on the base. And then just to the right of it is the piece that I'll be demonstrating during this tape, the building of that over a matrix. It's the first of probably several multiples. The seated figure is over a matrix, is from a matrix. Uh, ferro cement sculpture and it's the hammered copper but there's only one of those uh, so far. So we will soon be showing you the very beginning of this process. Cutting out plywood and assembling a sort of a plywood skeletal structure that we can then work the metal lath over starting with the ferro cement. This is the installation of the sculpture Sentinel 2 uh, at the Human Resource Center in Sarasota. My son Randy explaining that the rebar, which was splayed outward, is tied with a slip knot so that he can pull the pull the rope and have it spring open as he's gesturing there.
sculpture is about nine feet tall and uh, weighs about 75 pounds. It's got rebar cast on the inside. So we've tried many things, many techniques of filling this. We've tried filling them with foam and with ready mix concrete. And uh, the ready mix is dangerous because uh, it creates a tremendous hydrostatic pressure at the bottom. If you have any concavities, they tend to balloon outward. So we finally hit upon the possibility of using, as you can see on the dolly there, bags of dry ready mix gravel from uh, concrete from uh, uh, hardware supply and that works we put a bag or two in and then give it a, give it a spritz with a garden hose they're getting it down over the the tied up rebar. So when the cement's cast between my rebar on the inside of the sculpture and the rebar in the base, he pulls a rope and the rebar spreads outward and locks it. Now we're positioning the sculpture, get in the right, facing the road so that it can be seen from a distance as well as up close. And then we start the pouring process. We weren't that sure about whether it was going to run out at around the bottom, so always we run a bead of uh, caulking that can be stripped off. It's a caulking rubber, and uh, just in case it starts to leak out the bottom. This is Kay Glasser. It's through her unstinting effort that this whole complex was built. It's a human resource center for the blind and the aid to dependent children and uh, food stamps and everything that people in trouble need in Sarasota, all in one place. Before, they used to have to go all over the county to get from one store to one office to the other. We made a funnel. We've got a trap door side with a flap that we will close back after we've poured the concrete and pop rivet it with copper pop rivets. So if we have to get into it, we can get into it without having to cut up the sculpture. We can just drill out the rivets.
That's me standing down there, just watching sort of rapidly while all the work's being done by others. Best possible way. This is the ferro cement matrix from which the sentinels have been created. And uh, the copper was hammered over these and screwed in to the surface with tech screws wherever there was a concavity. Another print, if you will, from that same matrix, and uh, it was changed considerably from the first sentinel. It's made about a foot taller and had a wing attached to it so that you can modify, if you will, anything that's on the matrix you can add to it or after it's taken off of the ferro cement you can modify it then another angle of the of the piece showing the additions and the changes we have over here a matrix that hasn't had any pieces made of it yet uh, also turns out to be a very, very popular resting place for our flugel. The title of that is The Wounded Veteran. So the point is that if you do lots of doodles, lots of sketches for ideas this quick little rough gestures almost and uh, if you were doing something uh, larger and more important it would be maybe a little more detailed and then you transfer it. I just freehanded uh, this one and this one onto the plywood. So there is is the uh, cutout of the one onto the on the left. So what I 
I did, I took that one profile and cut it out. <coughs> then after I had it cut out, I stood it up and jerry-rigged and uh, uh, jack-legged the other profiles. How do you decide from just a 2D sketch on a paper how all of its sides are going to look in three dimensions? Well, that's the point, is that, that after, you st after you stand it up, well, then you put it sideways and you say, well, what would look good uh, as contrapuntal edges to work with this? And then you still got the leeway. Come on over here and look at this one. Sketch. Well, it's on another piece of paper. This is, this is then with a metal lath. And you've got the leeway of changing the lath to, to work more in the final, final form. So you can get much more of a three-dimensionality using the metal lath. like this has got a bad spot, then you just tech screw another another piece onto it. Since this uh, lath has got to be put on in pieces, it saves a lot of just tin snipping if you can get this electric snip to work.
get it to go into here. with uh, replaceable batteries and it's a little little soft so if we're doing little trim work it's very handy Another little filler right here. Needs a little more straightening out. There, I think that'll do it. So this is the cordless drill. It's reversible. It's got a magnetic bit holder so that when you do use a tech screw it holds it in place. Now this is so we come in from the back side on this. We've got an idea where it goes. Two of them is quite enough, but we'll do another one. <laughs> so now that's quite sturdy to hold up the last. So I'll just, instead of coming down like this, I'll probably just come right off here. And that'll fill in that arm form on the other side. So there's a lot of things are just rough, but all they are are just an, uh, a temporary armature until the metal lath is in place and wired, and then the metal lath is cemented. And uh, then they are, if you were, if this were to be a permanent piece, you'd probably fill it with uh, urethane foam. Uh, and then if the wood rots, it doesn't make any difference because the cement skin will hold it for a small piece like this cement and metal makes a good structure and then if it's filled with uh, foam or concrete uh, it would be a little consequence if the, if the wood rotted out because the wood isn't holding it up. A pair of end cutters and some tie wire in a loop. Put it in your belt loop. Now we'll do a close-up showing what we deal with. Something like that. This 
lath is quite malleable. It, this full sheet of lath that's about 30 inches wide and 8 feet long comes from a strip of metal that's probably about 8 inches wide and 48 inches long. And they've cut alternate cuts in it with a stamp and then pulled it apart. So it's, it's what's called expanded metal. And it, uh, it therefore can be recompressed Now how I'm making the hairpins is holding the wire like this. This is, seems to be an obvious thing, but it, it seems to be a difficulty everybody has. And you don't hold it hard enough to cut it, but you hold it hard enough to hold it. And then you pull it and make a tight hairpin, because if you're going through four or five layers of the lath, each one of them will be at a different angle, and you've got a very small hole to go through so that you want a small hairpin. And uh, then you go through and then pull it back where you've hooked both layers and then come in with the pliers or the end cutters and give it a twist and a snap and that's it. Now, let me show you something else while we're so you can take the pointed nose pliers and draw these edges in. Because if you leave it sticking out when you're cementing, well, you'll, your, your trowel will have to ride over every little part that sticks out. So that you can add on to the last, once you've got it roughed in, then you've got a sort of a basic form that you can hook into and add on anything you want or the reverse if you decide that you want to take it off you can take it off. Uh, you can just take the tin snips and, and cut it up and bow it in and put another piece there if you want a, a real concavity down and say, say that you, you wanted this to be a concavity. Uh, get just any kind of a tool concavity, you can just beat it in and the, and the last stretches. So it is very, very forgiving if you want to get in this more. You can deal with that. really sculpt the last quite sensitively with just a hammer or a stick or whatever you have to have here. You can just split this up with a tin snip, beat it back in, and slip another piece right in and make a hollow right there if you wished. Uh, by the same token, just like I'm doing here, if you wanted to put something that's very convex onto it, 
you could make it up separately and then put it on and wire it in all the way around and uh, add that to it. So down here now we want to close this in so we instead of trying to beat it in, we can just make one cut. in first. One of the reasons for doing ferro cement sculpture, which I picked up from reading books on Pierre Luigi Nervi's uh, architectural, he was an engineer in Italy and he was doing buildings with this technique and he would use uh, hardware cloth and rebar and was spanning hundreds and hundreds of feet with free span roofs uh, just by doing uh, three quarters of an inch of concrete just by the the fact that it was so completely reinforced he used five layers of hardware cloth and and a row of pencil rod but wiring it every every two or three inches together it's very labor intensive and it's only really valuable Italy pre-war Italy but uh, <coughs> He was building incredible buildings with this technique. I thought, well, that would be a good sculpture technique. So when I stand it up, I'll cement this, and then I'll have a matrix with which to hammer copper over. And do multiples in the, in the uh, copper repoussé technique. Now this is the maquette for the figure that I'm doing now in lath for the ferro cement. So that's the figure that I cast the shadow of onto the plywood, which I then cut out and made into this figure. So it's not an exact copy, but then nothing ever is because your obligation is always to the piece you're working on. So as you start enlarging a maquette, you start seeing things that should be changed because the scale's larger. And if it was 50 feet tall, it would change probably quite radically. So the next time, probably on this film, we'll have this being spray created and that's done with a machine in fact it's hanging right up there it's a funnel shape and you fill that full of cement soupy cement and you hook it up to a compressor you got a pistol grip down there and you aim it and it goes squirt cement all over the last. Which is real. I've got the white cement, one part of white cement, and two parts of pool mix, which is ground marble about the consistency of coarse sand. So you mix it dry first, then you add water. Because we're going to spray this, we want a rather soupy mix. We're going to add link, which is polyvinyl chloride. And this whole process. This is the gold blatt cement spray. It's just a large funnel 
and a trigger, the cement hangs down and as you pull the trigger back, it, the cement falls in front of it and it splatters out forward. The way to fill it by yourself is to set it in a button. Now we take this mix that I made. about rinsing this out because this has got, in effect, Elmer's glue and cement in here. And if you let it dry, it'll dry, and the Elmer's glue will dry before the cement sets. And you have lost yourself about a hundred dollar gadget. See how tight the pores are? It's hard as a rock. And, uh, you can spray another scratch coat on it if you wish and that would almost fill up the pores but it also tends possibly to make it a little rough so I'm going to go ahead and trowel into that just to show the process now I have mixed clay with this next batch it's a brown clay so it makes a brown brown troweling mix which in a way is good because it lets you know uh, where your second coat goes as opposed to the first coat. Uh, since it's a matrix it won't make a lot of difference what color it is. If you would want it to be white, pink, or brown you can always add pigment and spray it with a thin mix of white cement and link. Cement. Now the clay gives it a creamier consistency. So you hold the hawk underneath it to catch the parts that drip off. And you don't have that much weight. You see, because the pores have been well filled up with the spray coat. It holds this second coat quite nicely. Always trowel upward, otherwise it'll have a tendency to rock it'll have a tendency to fall down. If you trowel downward, it doesn't fill it quite as nicely. And it tends to roll off. See, it's not absolutely perfect, but it'll be a good second coat so that when you go do the finish coat, well, you'll have a good thick thick layer that you can pound on and weld on. It took me about two or three hours yesterday. And uh, I made it a little softer than the original mix so that we can knock off lumps. You can take any kind of a, of a tool. The things that, that when it was very soupy would, would just pile up the next day are soft enough to do this and start shaping up the surface. Which is very hard to do while it's while it's very soft. earlier mix 
that I did yet, earlier yesterday. And you can just tell by the sound of it, it's harder. But it's a hell of a lot easier to do it the next day than it is to do it the next week. The next week it's going to be like granite. And uh, you'll have to get a heavy grinder to take these bumps off. This way, then, when I do the final coat, I'll have a relatively benign surface to do the final smooth troweling. Now, right in here, I'm beginning to see something I don't really like. Well, bear with me. At this stage, this is this is a little little lumpy. I'd rather have something concave here than convex. So at this point, I think I can get away with doing this. Without destroying all of the cement. It'll weaken some of the stuff close by. That's one of the reasons I use lath. A lot of people use for things like this, talk about chicken wire and uh, uh, burlap and such, but the chicken wire and the burlap is such a big mesh that you don't have the flexibility of being able to stretch and to work on this surface like last time. As I tell my students, laugh and the world laughs with you. Now we do a close up to look at the surface that I just savaged. See it's still got a scratch coat. That's still because it had so much polyvinyl chloride, Elmer's glue link in it, uh, stayed fairly flexible. So you see it's white. There's some places right in the middle there where, where it's back to the galvanized lath. But beating on that one spot didn't, didn't damage the rest of it because it's pretty sturdy. Since the last time I uh, filmed, but it is still a bit rough so you can as you can see in this close-up the surface is still a little little rough so you take a uh, a grinder or a coarse rasp wood rasp and you can this never gets cheesy it crumbly soupy to crumbly to hard as a rock the aggregate in this is ground marble you can file on it with a file or with a grinder and it won't wear your file down or, or run your grinder down your disc because the marble is soft but if you're using sand as an aggregate it's like trying to file a grindstone you've got the quartz sand mixed in with the cement and uh, it really does a job on tools so the marble is the best the best aggregate to use for the ferro cement. Now this mix is the paint coat and it's very soupy. I put some color in it. It's got uh, two parts of perlite, one part of white cement, and half a part of link. Elmer's glue, polyvinyl chloride. 
And when you use a brush, you use a artificial bristle because the cement will eat up a organic natural bristle because it's a very strong ass, uh, base. It's like lye. So what we're doing here is this, this sort of fills in any deep cracks and gives a homogeneous, at this point, rather rough surface. This covers up a lot of errors. And nothing I do is terribly high tech. So that this is a soft polyethylene cover off of a butter dish. And just cut the ridge off so that your trailing edge is going to be smooth. And it makes a great tool to smooth down this surface. Now if it's too soupy, it won't work. And if it's too dry, it won't work. But because of the flexibility of this, it allows you to get in the crevices. And as I say, this perlite aggregate crushes. It's got just a little bit of resistance, enough to keep it from just smearing all over the place, but it isn't so liquid and brittle that it doesn't give way to this kind of treatment. And you can go back and use this mix, like I've got a little crevice there I might want to fill in. I can trowel that in, wait till it uh, achieves its uh, initial set or dries out enough to work it and then very gently go over it and level that out. The next step is to do the welded sculpture, the sheathing of this. So the first thing to do is take some kind of a marker and mark where it would be a mold line if you were to make a two-piece or a three-piece mold that you're going to take apart. So you want to find places that don't have too radical an undercut. Uh, so you just put this, this marker along the surface that you think things would pull apart easily without having too big an undercut and, and can't get off on one side. Say if I make the mark over here, but then the copper would be here and it would be very difficult for it to get off. You'd have to bend it up to get it out. Now right here, this is going to be tricky. Otherwise it's a fairly simple form. So we'll, we'll go ahead and do the big form. See we'll probably have to come over to here. then come down there so we won't have a big undercut and then come back there so when the copper gets around to here starts around but then we we screw that this probably will have to be made as a separate sub-assembly and then welded on afterward so we have the line is here, and it doesn't have to be exactly perfect. Just that this is riveted, and that's riveted. Rivet, rivet, rivet. And it comes across here, and then it comes up. So all the rest of these are welded. But right when I get to the dark line, to the black line, where the mold line is, it just riveted. So that when I get all of the welding done, and everything coming up to the line is riveted to the piece on the other side of the line. Then the, the copper work is pretty well finished. I take the rivets out and take the two halves apart. Or if it has a more complicated piece, it can be three pieces or five pieces or whatever. Take the rivets out 
And the one nice thing that, that you have is the holes will line up and you can put the rivets back in after you take it off of the ferro cement matrix. So then I use tex screws which can be reused. So I take the tex screw out, take the copper off of the ferro cement, put the two halves of the copper back, take the same tex screw, put it back in the same hole, everything lines up perfectly and uh, and you've got uh, a shell in copper of what the matrix was. So it's a, as I call it, a bit of a print technique. Uh, I can do multiples of these and then <coughs> I can do any kind of detailing on, the pe on this uh, copper after it's off of the matrix. So that if I want to do a detailed face I could do it. So because I happen to like simplified forms and simplified heads doesn't mean that it can't be done. This is done in copper. And you could do as, as detailed a piece of sculpture as you wish. This is where I store the copper. It's hard to store four by eight sheets of copper. I keep them from getting too badly chewed up. This is an electric uh, shear. agony of cramped hands use this for the lath and use this for the copper so if I want some smaller pieces I can pre-cut one of my very favorite tools is a little planishing hammer that's used for body work it's got a flat surface here sort of a rounded point there so that you can get in the areas you can flatten pieces across Here's our pre-cut pieces of copper so that they're, they're not annealed, uh, which means they're not softened with heat. If you're going to do a lot of tricky cuts, tricky bends, like this area right in here, you have to heat this all over and let it cool. And then it will be very soft, almost like lead foil. But for the most of the uh, big smooth forms uh, will use the regular copper right out of the factory. So we start with anywhere you want to start. A lot of it is just hand bending. We have a scrap piece and that just fits there perfectly. Now this is Foss Copper welding rod. It's Foss Copper Zero. And the zero tells how much silver is in, in, the, in the welding rod. You use a lot of little clamps like this to hold these surfaces together because the Foss Copper welding rod is very watery when it's hot. It tends to run. We can beat the storm. So you want to work with the top piece under the piece underneath so that gravity works for you. And it's very, very light clean. And it needs no flux. need a lot of cleaning. But the edges, the surfaces do need to be close together.
sometimes it's good to run a little bead up here and then tack it to hold the, hold the two surfaces together and then if it starts spreading out while it's melted tap it with your little handy dandy plenishing always close off the acetylene first, so you hear that little pop. <coughs> Otherwise, sometimes you'll have a flame residing somewhere down in your torch from just a little bit of leakage of acetylene and oxygen. And uh, you'll reach over to pick up the torch and you may leave the palm of your hand on the torch. So anyhow, this is the front of it, and I've used the tech screws to go in in places into the cement to hold down in the uh, hold the copper into the crevices so we've got random kind of pieces hanging out just a series of small bits and pieces sometimes to make it fit the contour and you hammer it until it fits clamp it and then weld it on and you just keep going a little bit at a time like my grandmother used to say like the cat ate the grindstone just a little bit at a time right-handed and left-handed tin snips so you can see that the blades are opposite each other. So the one handle is black and the other is, is red. So that if you wanted to cut a shaving off of this, that wouldn't work. But here, it would. So there are times when you can use a right-handed, but you can't. Say I wanted to cut that corner off. It would be very difficult to get at it with, a, with that snip. But with this one, it goes right in and, and works. So I'm just going to fill this in to this. I've got a mark here. Uh, this is going to have to be done separately and welded on afterward because there are too many undercuts on this. So I have to build this in its own little with its own little lines and two little pieces and then weld it together and then after this is all apart then weld it on where it's seamed. So uh, we'll put just a triangle in here and uh, we can get it roughly. Theoretically that ought to be about about right. And if it's not, why well, you can use that piece somewhere else. Fairly close. It's got a bend in it. screws that have a little drill bit ground right into the end of it so it's actually a metal <coughs> excuse me a metal tapping screw voila so they're fastened together tightly with another one to fasten it to the top. Always have a piece 
overlapping at the top. So when you weld, the, 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 the melted uh, rod will run downward. If you had it, if I tucked this up underneath, then it would have to work against gravity, and uh, you don't always get a good weld. you uh, are welding with this, it's a very, very light flame. You could almost do it with a, with a propane torch. Haven't used it in a while. So my rule of thumb on this is that if you just barely can hear it, that it's just about the right temperature. Too much and it will melt the copper. Too little and you'll spend a long time. And we'll tack it and we'll use a little planishing hammer go along and just anneal this this edge here enough so it'll lay down when you tap it the copper's a little springy now what will happen often is that the copper will will expand when it gets hot you have it laid down but when the well when the torch gets to it it'll sometimes blow because of course metal and everything else expands when it gets, gets hot. That's except water, but almost everything else does. See that flowed out again. One thing about this welding rod, it does not bridge gaps. Now there's a much more expensive version it has silver in it. And in fact, some of the trade names are Silflo. Uh, but then you start getting very, very expensive rod. But it will then bridge. If you've got a little little gap, it'll bridge it. But the, just the pure zero silver phosph copper rod uh, the, the pieces have to be pretty close together. And then, what you do, back it up and I'm turning the torch off. Turn this on reverse, this is a magnetic bit. So it'll take it right off. So as a word of explanation, this has been sheathed completely, this ferro-cement matrix has been sheathed completely with the copper. Now one thing I might warn anybody about on this is when you're doing a piece this small, make it skinny, make it considerably skinnier. Uh, then you want the copper to be because the copper is going to bridge over little depressions and it's going to be quite a bit larger. When I did the other ones that were 12 feet, 15 feet tall, it wasn't that great a problem. But on something bite sized like this, uh, it is. It is a problem. So this one's a little heftier than I would like it to be, which I may modify later on. 
Now, as I said earlier, this area here, this form, was tricky. And if I had it attached to the half, I wouldn't be able to get it off because they're deep, deep undercuts on it. So I made it separately in two parts. So theoretically, it should come off by itself. Then I reassemble this, and then because the holes give you the key to line back up again, I can put it back exactly where it came from. bit of undercuts on that that it won't be any problem because unlike a plaster mold uh, if you had an undercut like this you'd have a great problem getting it off without breaking the mold up this all you have to do is just pry it up and then when you put it put it back together hammer it back down so it mates <coughs>
working on these things. You're, you're just concerned with the little local spot that you're working on, so it looks like a good idea to kind of snug it down and, and weld it, and you're not aware of the fact that, that you're making an undercut that relates to an undercut on the other side, which makes it relatively impossible to get off without some kind of surgical process. so easy in the film, I can't understand why it isn't working so well for me. So I'm showing you 
all of the errors and mistakes that I made after having done it for many, many years, so that when you do do it and run into these kind of problems, you won't, you won't be appalled. do on a thing like this, because even something this small that it's put back together is going to be fragile uh, until it's filled with some kind of uh, material, cement, foam, whatever. So at this stage, somewhere along the line where you know that there's not too much distortion, you lay in rebar, a plumber supply, rigid copper tubing for welding or for soldering plumbing. And uh, if not flexible like the like uh, some of the coil copper tubing that you get for plumbing. You use copper because if you use steel, you would get a galvanic reaction uh, between the steel and the copper any kind of acidic acid, uh, acidic rain or anything gets in there where the two would touch, the steel, the iron, and the copper, it would create a, a little battery which in time would eat away usually the metal, the iron first and then the copper leave holes in it. That's what happens. So, uh, this rigid tubing uh, can be put in and welded wherever it touches and you'll still have some flexibility of putting uh, the two halves together, even though there was a little uh, warping, perhaps. Uh, you can put several of them in there. If you want more reinforcing, you can get a larger diameter rigid uh, pipe and put a rebar, steel rebar, on the inside of that and then seal it off at the top with some kind of caulking so no moisture can get in between the iron rebar and the copper tubing. Then you can weld the copper tubing on to your copper sculpture without any worry about galvanic action. I think it'll do it. Always have a...
things like body tools that the people, when you have a rear ender or get side swiped, they get this inside the fender and then they get a planishing hammer and they can work against the inertia of that so that you've got the same kind of situation. Like on this one, where I had the the hidden texture. that as a backup to flatten out any area. On occasion you may have to put more in it once you've got it lined up in order to draw down certain areas that don't seem to be drawn in that well. particular case right here, I felt it was a little chubby, uh, which I hadn't noticed that much in the, in the uh, matrix. The ferro cement from here, I realized that uh, it was a little too heavy right here. It should have been taller and uh, not quite so bulky at the bottom. What I did, I cut it, <coughs> cut both the halves right at the, what would be the ankles, strip of copper to the, to one side, then tech screwed the edges together and then stood it up and then angled it until it was right and then clamped these temporary pieces on uh, to hold the other side in place until I could put a permanent strip welded on. Obviously that I had uh, welded in a copper tube into the inside of it as reinforcing. Then I took the uh, pencil rod that fits inside that tubing. I extended the rebar that goes clear up into the head back down to where it's actually the, the two rebars are the ones that touch the ground more than the, the outer base. And that's steel with copper tubing. And then I welded steel uh, reinforced copper tubing around to the base uh, to give stability so that when the piece stands up, it actually is hanging on the rebar that go, that are welded to the sides and several points all the way up into the head so that there's no possibility of it collapsing while it's being filled with concrete or whatever filler is intended to be used when it goes to a permanent site. Now this side hasn't been welded yet so you still see where the tech screws are holding it together and we still haven't done that little cluster on the front yet. That'll be the last thing. So that's what I'll be doing on this side. And incidentally, this is a very handy way to uh, support it. It's a little hydraulic jack, it's very adjustable. 
and uh, you can make it uh, go up or down and, and position the piece any, any way you want. Another possibility would be to actually run a pipe through the middle all the way up and coming out of the top of the head and fastening it temporarily to the piece so that put it on two sawhorses and rotate it like uh, like it's on a spit, like a shish kebab. And then you can position a tall vertical piece like this any, any way you wish. The, uh, the rod of choice, which has an advantage of being stiff enough to push push things in. So you put a dop it a weld and then you push it in until it grabs and it sort of tacks, tacks it. And often this edge is more tempered and you need to go along and anneal it with the torch to soften it up so it'll lay down. Sometimes it shrinks away from the heat, so you have to go back with a, with a hammer while it's melted. Now, to fill up the holes, 8 inch rod doesn't do it that well. So I've got 1 16th rod, little tiny stuff about the size of a mechanical pencil in and it melts so fast that it makes a little blob right on right on top of the hole. Problem with it with the big rod is that by the time it melts it also has gotten the copper so hot that you can run a whole eighth inch rod through a hole and it'll just drip out on the other side. Take out the hot textures. That one shouldn't come out yet. Okay. Now we can plug those holes up. There again, you just set this 16th rod right in the hole and it makes a little bead and then it fuses. If you get the copper too hot, well you can just pour $50 worth of welding rod right through the hole. Now always remember that copper is incredibly conductive and keep a squirter on hand and always cool off because you'll inadvertently put your arm up on an area maybe two feet away and think that's far enough and it often isn't. Now we've got a uh, pucker right here. This is tied in with a uh, tech screw. This is tied in, but right here, if I try to hammer that in, it's going to make a bad pucker. So, thanks for making it. come together without, without making a big pucker. God knows we don't want any pucker sculpture. It's also still a little rigid, so it, once it gets hot, it gets considerably softer. Another thing that can be done like if you have a piece here that's too far apart, 
and you can't push this one in far enough and you can't get inside to hit it with a hammer, take your rod, put a, put a dop it right here first, and then take your rod and just weld it up above it, and then pull, pull on it as you weld it. So that keeps it from caving in. Until you can tack it. Your rod acts as a puller. And then you just unhook it. Right in here is where I extended it. tall sveltman and the dumpy little sister. Next step will be to patinate the copper. Quite light as a matter of fact compared with bronze or, or cement. So I lay them down for patination because if you stand them up uh, it will tend to streak and the streaks We'll run downward. <clears throat> this is a mix of ammonium chloride and uh, copper sulfate. Copper sulfate can be bought at a garden supply if you ask for blue stuff. And uh, just you acquire one of these uh, sprayers when the material's used up so that you don't put so much on it that it will actually do a lot of running. So you're just sort of fogging it on with a fine spray. Now this has already had a dark patina with liver of sulfur, sulfurated potash is called. Uh, very active. It smells like rotten eggs. And if it doesn't smell like rotten eggs, it's not any good. It's gone bad. It'll go bad in solution. So you take a little piece of the, of the uh, yellow colored rock that is the form that it comes in, the liver of sulfur, and uh, put it in a solution, let it dissolve, and uh, it will work on copper. This has been uh, uh, washed with a dilute solution of uh, sulfuric acid. If you put on the ammonium chloride, the green, greening solution first, the uh, liver of sulfur won't take. It has to have a fairly clean copper to work on. This way with it sideways, if it runs, it's not going to be so dramatic streak. Give it that old buried in manure for 2,000 years book. You let each layer dry so you don't get so much streaking do another light coat. It only looks like it's been buried in manure for 500 years so far. A few more sprays will be up to the 2,000 year mark. We have the green taking. So it has kind of a body effect, I may give it a little bit more. This needs some more, a little bit more there, here, but I think it'll be good. Bring back the highlights. One thing, if 
if you use steel wool, use only stainless steel wool. And the reason for that is if you use regular steel wool, it'll catch in some of the little crevices and it'll leave little microscopic threads of just the raw steel, which you won't even notice. But after a while, it makes a battery and it makes a long, ugly brown streak whenever it rains or gets wet. So if you use stainless steel, if a little thread catches up, it doesn't do that. You can make it darker, you can make it lighter. You can highlight it back to the copper. After you get all through, if especially if it's going to be inside, uh, you can spray it with a clear plastic spray, which will keep the uh, exposed copper from oxidizing, turning dark brown. This piece is called Job, and it's in front of Temple Emmanuel in Sarasota. And the challenge to me was that if I could make this technique do anything that a bronze could do. So I tried to do the hands as realistically as possible. And A Sarasota man is taking over City Hall with his art. News 40's John Quattlebaum has the story of this local sculptor whose work is showing up more and more in public places. Well, I don't intend for any of these to go anywhere. Uh, I do them and then they come along and, and put them places. <laughs> Lots of places. You can see Jack Cartledge's sculptures in front of a bank on South Tamiami Trail, at a Jewish synagogue, and most prominently in downtown Sarasota, where four recently donated works will turn City Hall into a Cartledge gallery. Well, I think it's great. I've had the uh, uh, Nobody's Listening there for since 62, and uh, to have four more pieces there, I'll, I'll have the only City Hall one-man show in the country. <laughs> Other than his creativity and craftsmanship, Cartledge says there's something else that makes him popular. He works cheap. He makes these large pieces out of copper when bronze would cost literally 10 times as much. It was always a problem with uh, architects would have a, a big building and a little budget for art. Another innovation allows him to teach his art a preliminary sculpture often comes from spreading a cement compound on a metal frame. Like frosting a cake. When it hardens, he wraps sheets of copper around it. Other pieces are shaped first and then filled with cement, like this one going to City Hall. It's called the Pioneer Family. Here's a sound. Is it bears or Billy Bowlegs? So Cartledge is an artistic pioneer, and there's no telling what he'll discover next. In Sarasota, I'm John Quattlebaum, News 40. Cartledge also teaches art at Sarasota's new college. Yeah, Busy look, man. Yeah, looks nice. Mm -hmm. Little trip in the sculpture world. This is the ferro cement matrix for the first copper piece of this tape. And these are the bagatelles from the little sketches that I'd done in the ferro cement. This is the reclining piece. It's more bagatelle than the others. This one still hasn't gone to City Hall. I've been redoing the base, waiting. This is the copper print from the first of the bagatelle, now being patinated. One of those bottles is liver of sulfur, sulfurated potash. 
the other one is ammonium chloride and over here is a dilute solution of hydrochloric acid. So patination is a hit or miss thing. Uh, you put it on and then you wash it off and then you look at it and then you say, eh, I don't like that very much. And then you throw some more acid on it, get it back down to the copper. And do it again. Hopefully you get something that as I've said many, many times in the preceding tape, you want it, I want it at least, to look like it's been buried in manure for a couple of thousand years. Gives you a little trip into my world of sculpture, which I do not for fame or money, but because, as I've told my students many times, because it hurts too much when I quit. <laughs>